significant uh, drop. And of course, around here, we have some amazing sites, uh, such as the uh, Mount of Beatitudes, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. This is where the Jordan River comes out of the Sea of Galilee, the baptism site. Uh, this is the Church of the Primacy of Peter, right on the shores of the Sea of Galilee of the Kinneret. Um, if you haven't been to all of these sites, we could spend about an hour on each of these churches and locations. So we're just giving a taste right now. Uh, we are gonna visit here in Capernaum. Uh, this is a resident that you see a lot in Israel if you haven't been. Uh, we have a lot of cats and um, these are feral cats, they run around, but Capernaum, the town of Jesus, we'll be visiting there. And uh, without further ado, let's land our spaceship, Google Earth, and let's uh, see where we have started here. So we're gonna start in our sister city in Tiberias. Is it sister city or just partnership or both? Sister? Okay. Um, so Tiberias uh, is an interesting place. It's, uh, this is from up above. Um, this is still part of, uh, this is called Tveria Elite, Upper Tiberias. And we're right on the main road coming down to the shores of the Sea of Galilee the Golan Heights on the other side. And again, when you talk about, I know for many people who read about the Sea of Galilee, you imagine something huge where there's storms and the boats and the fishermen. And um, the storms and the boats and the fishermen are definitely true, but um, it's a small lake, as you can see, you can see both uh, the, to the other side. Um, so not really a huge lake, but in the Bible, we know that things are bigger than uh, they really are. The mountains are really small hills, and the lakes are a little smaller, but that's okay. We're still amazing stories. Up here, by the way, is the city of Tzfat. That's uh, one of the highest cities in Israel, about 850 meters above sea level, 2,400 feet. Um, so let's visit in Tiberias a little bit. There's a lot of history in here. Uh, one of the interesting things is that Tiberias, while later on becomes a very important city in Judaism, uh, was not created as a Jewish city. It was created by one of the sons of King Herod, Herod the Great, um, that made his capital here uh, by the Sea of Galilee. And he names the city uh, after his patron, the Roman Emperor, uh, Emperor Tiberius, uh, that is his patron in Rome. And um, Herod Jr., they were all Four of them were called Herod something. I always confuse them. I think it's Herod Antipas, but I might be mistaken. Um, so as a Roman city, um, it has all of the makings of a Roman city. Uh, the main example is the Roman theater that unfortunately, and this is a real miss uh, that I think is slowly being um, corrected, that uh, the area of Tiberias has some amazing Roman ruins. This is one of them. As you can see, it's not excavated almost at all. A Roman theater with all of the Roman makings right on the shores. If you've been to Tiberias, we're by uh, Chofgil, uh, Chofgai, sorry. This is sort of south of the city itself. And there's some excellent um, Roman ruins over here from the time of uh, Herod Antipas, who's building this city as a Roman city. What's interesting about this uh, Roman city, and I wanted to see, no, they don't have that. What's interesting about it is that Tiberius is not mentioned in the Christian Bible, not mentioned in the, um, in the New Testament at all. But there are researchers that believe that this is uh, the entrance to the city, the Roman period, and later on Crusader, and that perhaps the Masons or the workers for this city came from the Jewish villages nearby. Tiberias was uh, created out of a small village made into a city. And the, the Jewish uh, settlements of the time were north of the city along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And maybe, maybe, maybe Jesus and the disciples were here to build part of the city. The time period fits. And as you know, uh, Jesus was an apprentice of his father Joseph, who was not a carpenter, as many of the stories like to say. He wasn't building tables and chairs, but rather 
He was more uh, something that's called a tetrarch, which is really more like a building engineer, uh, someone who really supervises the construction of different, uh, of different structures. You can see some of the stronghold, the uh, two towers over here, and this is literally, here's the second tower, the gates, uh, the entrance to Tiberius. There's of course a moat. The moat is from the Crusader period. Um, they built moats everywhere. What's the problem with moats in the land of Israel? You don't have a lot of water to waste and put in the moat. So in the most cases, these most remain, moats remain dry. Um, I actually wanted to show you in Tiberius some of the pictures. And my favorite, of course, is uh, a, uh, a park that my kids like to go to. There's plenty of water parks. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but this is the only freshwater lake in Israel, uh, which means that this is where Israelis come on vacation uh, during the holiday of Sukkot, the festival of booths, and during Passover. Uh, and then again in the summer, these areas are absolutely swarming with uh, Israelis coming to um, stay by the shore. And this is my kids' absolute favorite park. It's called Aqua Kef. It's these bouncy things. Um, it's great because you wear them out during the day and then they're totally exhausted. Uh, we've spent some great days here. So for me, this is one of the best features of uh, Tiberius. Um, okay, let's continue to a couple of historical sites in Tiberius. Uh, besides the Roman city that was a bit south of the city, there's another uh, element that's a little bit, maybe a mile, less than a mile south from here, which are hot springs. Oh, wait a minute. We're gonna, hope I'm not getting you too dizzy over here, but Google is helping us out. I didn't arrange this correctly. So this place is called Hamat Tveria, and the word Hamat comes from the word Ham, hot, um, and it's essentially hot springs. They still exist today. Um, wonderful uh, sulfur, kind of stinky, but a great place to hang out, especially in the winter. And the Romans really liked these hot springs. So by the city of Tiberius, the beginning really of Tiberius was a spa or a, uh, a place for people to go and uh, um, dip in the hot springs. And what we're seeing here are archaeological remains of the uh, of the Hamat Gader, of the spa, essentially. Uh, there's some very sophisticated channels where the Romans understood where the springs were and how to channel them into pools. Pretty elaborate stuff. And what we found here is an amazing mosaic uh, of a fifth century, uh, so late 400s, synagogue in Tiberias. And how do we know it's a synagogue? Because if you think about it, we have some problems here, right? There's animals. Uh, there's actually a person over here. Jews are not allowed to do those kind of things, right? One of the Ten Commandments. But how do we know it is a Jewish uh, synagogue? Because we have the menorahs, uh, the Jewish symbol of the time of Jesus and until the Middle Ages, essentially, is not the Star of David, but rather the menorah, the seven-armed candelabra, and a symbol of the temple in the middle. And what this is, is a very interesting theory by uh, researchers. We don't know for sure. There's about five or six of these similar mosaic floors around the Galilee. And the theory is that uh, we're essentially using the pictures because most of the residents of the Galilee couldn't read their Bible, couldn't read the Torah. They, uh, uh, it's kind of amazing to think as an Israeli, what do you mean you couldn't read the Torah? It's in Hebrew. But when you think about people uh, living in the United States, for example, uh, most of the American Jews and North American Jews and Jews around the world, uh, their Hebrew is not that great. Um, they know the prayers, not always understanding what they're saying. And for many uh, centuries, this was the case here too. So this is essentially a, uh, a picture um, explanation of the essence of, uh, of Judaism. Uh, God symbol symbolized by the Greek god Helios, Oive in a synagogue, and we have a Greek god. Uh, but the idea is that God Almighty controls the different, the zodiac, by the way, not a Jewish symbol either, 
um, controls the different seasons and uh, we're a agricultural society. We need depend on rain in this region. So God Almighty controls everything here. And God with the covenant created with Abraham uh, has basically promised uh, the, the Jewish people that the temple will be rebuilt once again in Jerusalem, symbolized by a temple and the two menorahs. Actually, it's one menorah in the story, but uh, that's the general idea. It's also directed, you can see this is a recreation of what might have been here. Um, and the direction is towards Jerusalem, and that's uh, Jews pray towards Jerusalem. So indications show that even though there are people and animals, this is in fact a synagogue. So next time you come to Tiberias, this is a great place uh, to visit. But uh, before we continue, let's go visit a very important site in Tiberias, very important for the Jewish people. And that is the tomb of the Rambam or Maimonides in, uh, in English. Um, his name is Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, Rabbi Moshe, son of Maimon. This is a new structure that was put up in the last few years. Um, it's sort of a flame, an eternal flame of this rabbi. Maimonides uh, lived in uh, Spain most of his life. He was born in Cordoba in the 11th century during the golden age of Spain and is considered one of the Justice League superheroes of the uh, rabbis of Judaism. Uh, a lot of what we do today is based on his understanding of the Torah and uh, everything that he taught. And in fact, on his tomb, um, I'm assuming you don't read Hebrew, but you'll have to take my word for it. It says here, this is his mar the marker of where he's buried. Um, he was a Zionist, as odd as that may sound in the 11th century, but he understood that when the Jews were starting to be driven out from Spain already during the 1200s and eventually, finally in 1492, um, he started moving towards the Muslim world, um, settled in Cairo for a long time and eventually came to Tiberias, which is where he uh, died and he wanted to be buried in the Holy Land. Tiberias at that point was one of the important cities of Judaism. So this marker says, Mi Moshe ad Moshe, lo kam ke Moshe. From Moses, the big shot, the, the Moses, until this Moses, there was no other Moses that ever uh, stood up for the Jewish people. In other words, think about this. His followers are comparing him to the Moses, the big shot that we have in the Tanakh, uh, just to show you how important and how uh, his followers felt that he was such an important uh, personality. So from Moses until Moses, there wasn't anyone who was as great as Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, Moses, the, uh, the fa the f one of our ancestors, one of our patriarchs, as we, uh, as we call him. Okay, this we already saw, and now, We'll continue, I'll stop the map for a minute just to show you. This is the outskirts of Tiberias. We're continuing along the Sea of Galilee with our very cool uh, Google Earth. Uh, we're continuing to this area, which is um, essentially the area that is very, very important for the Christian world from Magdala or Migdal, the town where Mary Magdalene comes from and more about that very soon to the village of Capernaum or Kfar Nahum. Uh, this entire area is really the most important site for uh, Christian pilgrims in this, uh, in this region. So let's land in Capernaum. Amy. I forgot to bring my phone over so that I have uh, indication of time because I could, speak until tomorrow. Okay. Um, so we are in Magdala or Migdal, which is the uh, town where Mary Magdalene is from. But more importantly, Migdal, unlike Tiberias, who was the Gentile center of the region, Migdal was the biggest city. Um, and when I say city, we're not talking about, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma or Oklahoma City. We're talking about maybe 10,000 people at most, uh, probably less than that. 
but it was the largest uh, village town in this area that was uh, very important because of one very important reason. It was the market for all of the uh, fish that were fish out of the uh, uh, out of the lake. And as we know, many of the stories of the Bible, many of the stories of the New Testament, the Christian Bible, talk about Jesus and the disciples who were fishermen. Lots of uh, connections to uh, fishing. And all of the villages, Capernaum, Chorazim, Bethsaida, um, other villages around this area would bring their fish to the market in Migdal. And how do we know that there was a fish market over here? Because over here, we found essentially um, stalls or small shops with little pools that we assume were just like at Red Lobster when you can say, oh, I want that one. Uh, there was a pool there with the fish swimming inside that people could uh, actually choose live fish. And we found lots of evidence of salting. Um, back then, there was no beef jerky, but there was fish jerky. Uh, there was salting of the fish, and uh, they, the, that would allow the fish to, uh, or that fish jerky essentially, to uh, survive for a few months. It was what they would take on voyages and so on. But the main event is this. This is an incredible, incredible find for both Jews and Christians. Uh, if you've been to Israel within the last five years, um, you probably did not come to this site. As much as this sounds like an oxymoron, it's a new archaeological site. Uh, this is a brand new hotel that is now completed. They just opened November of, uh, of last year um, that was built by the Catholic Church from uh, Mexico, and they bought this piece of land. And uh, when they were starting to dig the foundations of this building, they ran into this amazing synagogue from the first century. Uh, and when I say first century, it means zero to 100 AD. Uh, and even though Migdal is not mentioned as a place where Jesus was teaching and visiting, there are some scholars that say, uh, there's a sentence, I don't remember in which book, that says, um, Jesus walked around the Galilee and taught in all of the cities and villages in the synagogues. So if it says all, and Migdal was the largest town in the area, it's very likely that Jesus was in this uh, synagogue, which makes it a very, very big deal for Christian pilgrims. You can see how fancy it is with some mosaic floors. There's even uh, plaster here on the walls, what's called frescoes. It's essentially, you can see a little bit of it over here on the, uh, this uh, pillar as well, and over here on this one. Um, it's essentially, the, everything that you see was plastered. It wasn't the, you couldn't see the building blocks. They would take some uh, limestone, grind it up into a powder, add some water, and then it's kind of plaster of Paris that we have today. They would smear it on the walls, and then you had an artist that would come and paint the walls, as the plaster was drying and you would have it uh, permanently on the wall. So this is a wealthy community that could afford to uh, have a fancy synagogue. Now the really amazing uh, thing about this find is this stone, which is known today as the Magdala stone. And in order to see it better, I'm gonna be jumping over to a different program where, oh, didn't plan this right. We'll come back to that. Um, to Magdala, in order to show you, here we are in that similar uh, picture. And what I've done here is I was able to uh, bring in some close-ups. Here you can see the plaster on the wall. And again, the stones were not seen. You can see the different shades and different uh, coloring. And what's really cool about this uh, stone is the stuff that's on it. So if you're looking at the stone from the front, you can see the menorah, which of course is the Jewish symbol. And you can see the containers on the side, which usually symbolizes the Levites, who were essentially the altar boys. They were those who washed the hands of the uh, priests 
at the uh, temple. And when I say priests, of course, I'm talking about the priests at the temple, the Jewish priests at the temple, Mr. Cohen. And if you know anyone, Mr. Cohen, they're obviously descendants of those people. And this is one uh, view of it. And the other view, uh, this is a little bit farther away. Uh, we don't actually know what this is. I'll preface with that. Uh, the theory is, and the prevailing theory that I really like and makes sense to me, is that this was a stand. There were probably four legs of wood uh, that were holding this thing up, or maybe it was the other way. The beams of wood, the legs of wood were up here, and this was the bottom of it. But really what we're seeing here in the front is a snapshot of what a pilgrim going uh, on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, getting ready to give their sacrifice to the priests, uh, this is what they would see. They would see the Levites standing around. They're not allowed into that courtyard. So they would see the menorah from pretty far ahead. And you can see that the menorah is sitting on an altar. So when you think about it, this is only two-dimensional. They weren't that sophisticated to get a real picture. So it's as if the menorah is farther in, but because it's a two-dimensional picture, it looks like the menorah is standing on top of the altar. So the uh, archeologist that uh, came up with this theory is basically saying, this is a podcast. This is a message from our sponsor, everyone coming into the synagogue and sitting around in the square, uh, talking uh, and learning. Okay, remember that this is a, a seating in a, a shape of a square. Uh, everyone would be looking at this and remembering that this is what the temple in Jerusalem looks like. Uh, this is a very important Jewish site as well because it's a Jewish city. It's a synagogue from the first century that's very, very well preserved. And for many uh, decades, up until about 30 years ago, there was a theory that synagogues only started after the destruction of the temple and essentially took the place of we can no longer go to the temple in Jerusalem on the three pilgrimage holidays. And instead we created the synagogue as a place of worship. Uh, that was a prevailing theories until about the 1970s when we started finding first at Masada and then in other places around mostly in the Galilee, finding synagogues that we now understand existed before the time of, uh, of the destruction of the temple. So it's thought that it's used as a JCC, essentially, a place of activities, a place of learning, a place of gathering, not necessarily what synagogue um, symbolizes for us today. Okay, we're on a roll here. Everyone okay? Let's stop for a minute if there are any questions. If not, we'll continue to Kfar Nachum or Capernaum, the town of Jesus. Debbie and uh, Chen, you can see if there are any questions. We're okay. All right, there will be time at the end for questions. Uh, so we're continuing a little bit farther down the coast to really the highlight of tourists and pilgrims coming to this area because uh, this is Kfar Nachum. It's named after, um, to be honest, we don't know the actual name where it comes from. Uh, maybe the prophet Nahum. Um, it's not pronounced that way in English, and I always forget how you guys pronounce it. Uh, Nakum or something like that, N-A-C-H-U-M. <clears throat> By the way, the word Nahum means comforting, which is an interesting connection when you think about the town where Jesus uh, lived and performed a lot of his uh, miracles. Um, so maybe Nahum lived here, maybe Nahum uh, is buried around here, but uh, this is a village, a fisherman's village. And uh, many of the things that we can see here are some uh, really cool excavations and a very impressive synagogue. This white structure over here, which we'll visit very soon uh, from the 600s uh, AD. So we know that this is a, a synagogue that's later than the one we saw in Tiberius and decorated in a very different way. There's no mosaics, but rather a very fancy cathedral style building. But the highlight of this place is, and we'll see a few of the pictures. Uh, here's the synagogue, we'll go in here very soon. Um, these columns were uh, 
fell down, but the uh, Parks Authority um, stood them back up. This was a lintel that was added, it was uh, part of the top here. So it was added later on. Um, but again, it was put back there to give us an idea of what this place looked like. Uh, notice that most of the village is not made out of the limestone, but rather from the darker color basalt, which is the local uh, stone around here. And this is the most important thing that was found. And this is a Byzantine church. Who are the Byzantines? Let's go back a little bit. Uh, Jesus is crucified around 29 <clears throat> to 31. But Christians and uh, Jews at the time are not allowed to practice openly. The Romans are not allowing it. So they're persecuted. They're not allowed to show their religion. Only in 325, so 300 years later, Constantine, the Roman emperor, converts the Roman Empire into Christianity. It becomes the official religion. And then all of a sudden, Christianity is openly allowed. His mother, Helena, St. Helen, comes to the Holy Land uh, immediately after, around the three, late 320s, and she identifies many of the locations where the miracles and stories of Jesus took place. And when she comes to Capernaum, Kfarnachum, she identifies the uh, location of the house of Peter the fisherman. Okay, here's a statue of Peter. And in a minute, I'll talk about how do we know that it is, in fact, the house of Peter the fisherman. By the way, the city of Tiberias is on this uh, slope over here in the background. Um, how do we know this is Peter? First of all, because it says on the statue. Uh, but the other thing is there's a lot of symbolism in Christian uh, art. Um, he's holding the key to the gates of heaven. He's got a staff which uh, uh, symbolize him as a leader. Um, in the Catholic Church, Peter is considered the first pope, the first keeper of the church. And it's a little hard to see, but there's actually a fish down here, again, symbolizing the uh, fishermen. And of course, the most famous quote from Matthew that Jesus says to uh, Simon, son of Jonah, he says to him, Simon, son of Jonah, you are the rock on top of which I will build my church. And uh, the word rock in Greek, which the New Testament was written in Greek, uh, the word rock is Petros. And from that point on, he's known as Simon Peter in the New Testament in the Christian Bible. So how do, let's go back to how do we know that this is the house of Peter? Uh, so the answer is we don't know for sure, but there's pretty, a pretty good chance and some pretty good archaeological evidence that support it. Um, what we're seeing here is very little left of the house of Peter the fisherman. He was a modest guy, not a very, uh, uh, you know, not very rich. And back then, houses were not uh, huge buildings. So the middle here is the house of Peter. And how do we know this? Because we found a regular style house with a very well used floor, much better or much more usage than the houses around, which means that this was a house that was visited a lot. We know that during the 300 years from the crucifixion of Jesus until Christianity was allowed, Christians were um, getting together, gathering for communion on Sunday in places that they called a house church or domus ecclesia. In other words, it was someone's house that secretly they would gather and have prayer and communion. And the assumption is that the house of Peter the fisherman would have been a very important place to do this. We also found graffiti on the walls of uh, uh, the fish symbol and a stick figure with its head detached to it. Who is that? Very famous in the uh, story, John the Baptist. Uh, and we've seen these graffiti. Uh, when I say graffiti, it's etchings on the walls. Um, again, they couldn't have statues or fancy things because technically they're not allowed to practice their religion. So when Helena comes, she identifies the location. Someone showed her where it is. And this is 325 AD. So she builds an octagonal church, which is the walls that we see here, 
on top of the house of Peter the fisherman, which uh, as, as I said, um, it's very likely that this is in fact the spot, or at least Helena knew something we don't know uh, 1700 years ago about this location. This very fancy modern church is built right on top of the octagonal structure that we just saw. And uh, it's very cool. I call it the flying saucer because it's literally hovering above the archaeology, which is a great way for visitors to see the archaeology while the church is built right on top. It's a Catholic Franciscan church. And I want to point out the distance between the church and the synagogue. When the synagogue was built in the 600s, there was already a Christian Byzantine built by Helena church standing here. And the fact that we're in downtown Capernaum and a big fancy synagogue next to a big fancy church means that Jews and Christians got along, that we understood each other, we related to each other in many different ways. So uh, I think that's a very important point to understand today about this newly found understanding and openness between Christians and Jews, and I think that's a very important point to make here. Um, I want to take us back to our uh, different system here and bring you back to uh, Capernaum because I want to show you uh, something very cool here. So first of all, here we are in the, uh, in the synagogue. And how do we know it's a synagogue? There's two things. One, we found over here in Greek, the donor's board. And on the donor's board, it says, so-and-so, I never remember his name, uh, that grew up in this community, lives in Sidon, a city on the Lebanese coast, um, donated the money for this wonderful synagogue. So it says it. The other thing is what we don't see. What do we don't see? We don't see any statues. We don't see any animals or uh, people engravings. Um, I'll show you very soon on the side here, they have a display of what the top would have looked like with all of the decorations and uh, carvings. So we'll see that in a moment. There's Jewish symbols in there, of course. Just one more point that I wanna show you is, uh, you see how these uh, corner columns look like they're a little bit bigger. they are like three columns fused together. And that leads researchers to believe that this building probably had a second floor. So it was a cathedral with a top floor. Uh, you can see the bleachers or benches over here. Maybe the top floor was the women's section, maybe it was part of the, of the buildings, but uh, it's, a, it's a large structure. There's an addition over here. And remember, this is probably a JCC. Um, there's holiday celebrations. This is where they would gather together. This is where they would watch the next installment of Star Wars when it came out and community life would take place here. Now, what is it that they found here that makes us believe that this is in fact a synagogue? There are several things that are on display over here where this group is standing and you can see some of the columns and some of the top of the walls where you can see uh, lots of decorations. Uh, for example, this interesting thing, this is a symbol of the temple. There's, a, I think, a bigger picture of it. We know that in different places around uh, the country, this symbolizes the temple, the pillars and the uh, doors. But what's puzzling to many of the researchers is that it's on wheels. It's almost like it's a, a structure of the temple that's on wheels. I'll get back to that uh, very soon and tell you what I think that is. Uh, we also see all kinds of Jewish uh, symbols. We have pomegranates, um, there's uh, the rosetta, there's different palm branches, um, there's other different elements over here, grapes, and of course, lots of uh, decorations. So I know the five uh, pointed star today has all kinds of other meanings, but it's simply a geometric shape. And by the way, there are stars of David here as well, also as a geometric shape. And there's also a menorah that was found on one of these columns, again, uh, showing that this is in fact uh, an important symbol in Judaism. Um, Excellent. So the, th the theory about this 
is that it was actually uh, the, the structure that we saw was used more as a JCC rather than a place of prayer. And that the ark with the Torah scroll in it was rolled in and out when they needed it during the holiday. Uh, now, this is an interesting theory. It's just a theory. To me, it makes a lot of sense. I grew up on a kibbutz, uh, which is a, uh, a farm community, farming community. We had a members club that was used by the members of the kibbutz after dinner, they would go over. It was the only color TV in the kibbutz. That's how old I am. Um, but we on holidays would use that same space for a synagogue. And we had a little closet in the side of that room that when we needed the Torah scroll, it was on wheels, just like this. And it was wheeled out to the center of the room and we would set up the chairs uh, like a sort of a, a style that uh, everyone was facing towards the ark and the reader from the Torah, and that was our synagogue. So this, to me, this theory makes uh, a lot of sense. Okay, let's go back to our uh, um, places here, and from here we'll continue to Nazareth. Uh, we doing okay? Yeah, we can do Nazareth in about. Uh, seven minutes, and then we'll have time for questions. So the first place we landed in uh, Nazareth is Mount Precipice. Uh, Mount Precipice, this is Nazareth down below here. Today, a very big city. But at the time, um, this top of this hill, perhaps uh, one of the cliffs right uh, above Nazareth, you have an amazing view from here. You have the mountains of the Shomron, Samaria. Over here in the background here is Mount Gilboa, where Saul and his three sons were killed in battle with the Philistines. Down here is the village of Eindo, where Saul sneaks at night to talk to the soothsayer to bring back Samuel to tell him what's going to happen. Um, we have the hill of Moe over here with the uh, town of called Nin to this day, by the way. Uh, still called Nin, where Jesus uh, meets with a widow. Later, uh, before that, Elisha uh, cures the son of the widow. Uh, these are stories from the, uh, uh, from the Christian Bible and the New Testament. And this is Mount Tabor, Mount Tavo, where in Christianity, it's the site of the transfiguration. And in Judaism, at the foothills of Mount Tavo, is where Deborah, Dvora, the prophetess, the judge, was sitting in judgment, and the whole story of Barak and Yael, Jael, and the fight against Sisera happened down here in the valley. I mean, this is an incredible place. Uh, by the way, this big village down here is called Daburia, even today, preserving the name uh, right uh, below the, uh, the hill. Uh, so when you think about this site and you think uh, Jesus and his friends growing up in the town of Nazareth or the village down below, this could have been a place where they would come up and watch some TV. They would sit here, and of course, they all knew their Bible and their uh, stories, and they would say, hey, look over there. That's where Saul and his three sons and the story took place. And over there in the distance is Mount Carmel, where Elijah had the uh, test against the Baal prophets. And so it was could have been uh, a very interesting place where possibly Jesus uh, would come to during his uh, childhood. Um, this is a very uh, important spot. Many, uh, many groups come up here to take a look and see what you can, uh, the view that you can see from here. Um, this is also believed to be the site where the story of Jesus in the synagogue in Nazareth, where he stands up and reads from the book of Isaiah, essentially saying, I am the prophet that the book of Isaiah is talking about, uh, Isaiah 53, but I might be wrong. Um, and the people are so uh, pissed off at him. Who is this little Pisher that we remember him as little, little Jesus running around in the village, and they take him up to the top of the hill to get rid of him and uh, throw him into the abyss. And as the story goes, he, uh, all of a sudden, there's a cloud that comes down, and there's uh, a lot of mist and fog around, 
and he walks among them and disappears. Um, again, maybe this was the spot. We don't have an actual location for it. From here, let's land in the uh, Church of the Nativity, inside or the Basilica of the Nativity. Uh, sorry, the Basilica of the Annunciation. Nativity is in Bethlehem. Uh, this is a modern structure. We'll see some pictures in a moment. Um, built in the 1960s by the Israeli National Building Company, Solel Bonnet. Kind of an interesting twist there. Um, and what's really cool about it is that there are murals on the walls that each country of the world that uh, is connected to Christianity and to the stories of Christianity donated some money and uh, gave money for these murals, sent the, these murals in. Um, the American is over here. I was going to get a picture of it and I forgot. Uh, but this is the American. Uh, this is Mary, the mother. Um, the church itself is dedicated to Mary, the mother. And we're standing right above the original church. We'll go down in a minute and see what's down here. Uh, this is the modern 1960s church. And it's uh, designed to look like a ship. Why ship? Mary, the mother, was the vessel carrying Jesus into the world. She's, um, in many ways, she's the guiding light and the guiding principle uh, in his life and in other uh, events in the Christian story. And you'll see a lot of the letter M's, geometric shapes of the letter M in all of these different areas. This is the cave that is down below where we're standing that is believed to be by uh, mostly the Catholic and Orthodox world, uh, that this is the cave where Mary, the mother, was receiving the uh, message from Gabriel, the angel, that tells her that she is pregnant carrying the Son of God, uh, which is why it's called the Church of the Annunciation. So we were up here, and what we see here is the church, the remains of the church down below, these columns and some of the mosaics, mosaic floors are from the uh, original church built by Helena, 325 AD. Let's go to our next and last stop here to actually walk in to that area. So we're down below. Okay, we were up here before and in, uh, in this area up here. And what we can see down here are these columns and part of the mosaic floor down here is part of the um, church built by Helena. Let's continue farther down. And here we are right in front of the cave that, again, is believed to be where this event uh, took place. Many people walk down here, stop and take pictures or say a prayer. And what's really amazing is these mosaic floors, floors down here. These are from the Byzantine church. So these are about 1600 year old mosaics. And there are uh, many groups that uh, book some time to have a uh, mass down here. And it's uh, one of the most interesting and uh, uh, meaningful things for groups that come uh, to this area. So here's those mosaics once again. And what we can see here is actually one of the apps uh, of the church built by uh, Helena. And above it, we can actually see some of this wall here and the columns. This is already Crusader. And I didn't really get into that because uh, around 650, Islam takes over the area. Um, Islam and Christianity got along fairly well. But in the year 1000 or so, there's a king in Egypt that decides to destroy all of the churches in the land. Uh, this is 1001. Word travels to Europe. And then in 1099, the crusaders come in and take over the land and rebuild many of the churches. So you can see here this wall, which was incorporated into the modern structure, is from only 900 years ago from the crusaders. And down here, the apse and the mosaic is from uh, about 1,600 years ago from Helena, the mother of Constantine. And here's more of the mosaic floors that were uh, embedded into this floor. 
Whew. Okay, that was a whirlwind around the uh, Sea of Galilee area. I hope you guys are still uh, okay and breathing out there. So uh, I'm here for any questions or aha moments, remarks. Bevakasha. You have to unmute yourself if you have a question. I see there are some things in the chat. I have a question. Yes, sir. The visual that you're using, you introduced it by saying it was a Google era, uh, aerial. Uh, yes. Is this something that we can access or is it proprietary to you? Um, so the answer is uh, a bit complicated, uh, like everything. Uh, it's called Google Earth. It's uh, if you have a Google email, you could actually, it's in one of those uh, many other apps that Google provides. Um, so you can actually uh, see everything that I showed you. Um, it's available. The places where I clicked on the uh, square in the corner that has uh, pictures that Google provides. Uh, but organizing in a tour like this is something that I created. And that's something that is in my Google Drive. In other words, I'd have to provide you access and share it if you want to use it and see it again. But the, the pictures, the satellite is all provided by, uh, by Google. Uh, the other app that I used is called Tour Creator. It's also uh, Google Street View. It's uh, similar. Uh, that Google decided that it's, uh, it was created for classrooms. And they've decided that it's not as cool as Google Earth anymore. And it's uh, being phased out in about uh, six or seven months, according to what they say. It but was yeah, very, is, uh, very effective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I agree. I think it's a very cool way to be there without getting on a plane and actually being here. So thank you. OK, I've been to Israel once. Very good, good. I'm glad you uh, you enjoyed it. Um, any anyone else? Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question, uh, Gotti. Uh, Mark Lobo. Yes. Uh, I was involved in uh, Israel programming with the Federation. Still am, but uh, been involved with that for about 20 years. Shalom. Last time I was in uh, Tiberias. Well, probably re more recently than that. But in 2013, we had a tour, and we visited the Tulsa Auditorium that was established in, and I forget the neighborhood, but it was due to the project renewal that Israel was conducting in those uh, 80s period. Um, uh, anyway, it's been 18 years almost since I've been in that auditorium with a group from Tulsa. And um, I wonder what, what's the status of it now? What's the status of that area in Tiberias? I have to say, <laughs> I, really, I really don't know. What? Have you ever been, uh, have you been to the Tulsa Auditorium? I have not. No, I've oh, been to Tiberius I, many times. But I, I have to remember somehow the neighborhood. It was one of the, gosh, I can't remember the location. I think it was in the south part of Tiberius, and it was kind of a depressed neighborhood. Um, so the, the southern, from the center of town towards the uh, south, where the archaeology is, um, is definitely the, uh, the more neglected and older part of town. Uh, they definitely did a lot of renewing and uh, very important stuff in the center of town where those parts are. Um, I, I have to say that I, I've not lived in Tiberias, so I don't know uh, much about that place. I'm sorry to say, but uh, I can look it up and I have Chen's uh, email. I'll send her a message and let her know if it's, uh, if it's in fact still around. Good. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the tour. I mean, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be worn out otherwise, but I've just been sitting here watching. It's wonderful. Very good job. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, Rabbi. Anybody else, my friends? Uh, I hope you enjoyed our tour. I tried to give a little bit of, uh, of everything. And as I said, we could spend another few hours on these uh, sites. There's, of course, the site of the uh, miracle of fishes and loaves and Tabcha and the Mount of Beatitudes and Tsipori is nearby, which is a Roman city with amazing mosaics. Uh, there's some really cool stuff that we can do there. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'll turn it back to uh, 
um, Fen and Debbie to, if there's any wrap up things to say. I was gonna Thanks. mention um, the boat that's right on the shore of the Canaret um, that supposedly is from the time of Jesus. Yes. And I, I, I actually had it in the presentation uh, when I was preparing it, and I wasn't sure if time-wise it would fit in, but uh, that's a very uh, cool story, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't bring it in, uh, but there's a, a wonderful uh, boat that, uh, it's a fishing boat that was found by the um, uh, two kibbutz members that were walking around on the shores by kibbutz Genosav. And they, uh, the Sea of Galilee level was very low at that year. And they found a piece of wood that was uh, obviously ancient. And they uh, started digging around and they found a, a pretty well intact fishing boat from the time of uh, the Second Temple period, the time of Jesus. Uh, so it's nicknamed the Jesus boat. We have no indication that Jesus and the disciples were actually in that boat. But what I like about it is that it gives, it gives an amazing visual to people who know the stories and grew up uh, reading the stories of the fishermen. And uh, there's many stories of the disciples and Jesus in the, in the fishing boat. And when you see the size of it, it's like, wow, now I can really understand the distances and the size. Uh, I mean, it's the size of, uh, I'd say, a bus. Um, about as wide of a, of a city bus, uh, a little shorter probably, and you could fit maybe 10, 15 people in there with some supplies. So it's a very cool find. And what's really uh, interesting about it is they started digging it out of the mud and they couldn't, uh, it started falling apart. I mean, it is wood uh, from 2000 years ago and they found some kind of foam material that they injected all around it, which made it float. And that fishing boat from 2000 years ago float, uh, they floated and, uh, and sailed it uh, for the first time in 2000 years since it sunk about two miles down the shore to the kibbutz where it's in a museum today. So it's a very cool story. I should have uh, asked for a request, Debbie. I could have uh, put your favorite sites in there to make sure that we hit all the good spots. So I just want to say that this is the beginning as we 